Today, let's look at what it's like to have a meal with Jesus. This story is a this, st this story about a meal comes in the middle of Luke's gospel. And that seems rather a suitable place as having meals with people seems to have been an important part of the work that Jesus did. Eating together is, in some ways, symbolic of the kingdom of God, with the closeness, with the sharing. When Jesus walked the dusty trails of Palestine, it was the custom to eat two meals a day. The major meal was supper. Usually, it was eaten after work had ended, when the sun had gone down. At that time of the day, it was cool, and they could relax. Evening was also when the Greeks and the Romans ate their main meal. On this occasion, Jesus has been invited to eat by one of the Pharisees who was listening to his outdoor speech. It was the first meal of the day to which he was invited. And that's the meaning of the Greek word aristal. It was a small meal, a meal that we might call brunch, breakfast and lunch, all rolled into one eaten at around noon. And the focus of these meals was not eating, as you might expect. It was, in fact, an occasion for talking. These types of meal were common at that time. And the purpose of these meals was to sit around, or perhaps recline, and listen to moral instruction. And this kind of meeting came to be called a symposium. So Jesus was invited by the Pharisee not for food, but to talk to a group while they shared a small meal. It was not strange that Jesus started to give a sermon in the middle of breakfast. That was partly why he had been invited. Another reason may have been to get him to say something incriminating. If they expected Jesus to give a quiet talk, the Pharisee and his friends were probably surprised by the aggressive words and the aggressive actions of Jesus. The host of this meal would have been seen by society as an honorable man. He had probably invited prominent teachers on many occasions so that they could show off their education. To start with, Jesus didn't wash his hands before the meal. How many of you would be upset by that behavior in your home? Polite society and important guests all wash their hands according to the tradition. It was good manners. And it showed respect for the Jewish religion. The fact is, however, that this is not a rule from the Old Testament. It was a strong tradition that had become somehow very important. And perhaps we have similar feelings about our church traditions, traditions that aren't actually in the Bible. And we also can feel most upset when they're ignored. For example, some people feel disturbed by women in church who don't wear a veil, who don't cover their head. Jesus began his teaching at the door by rejecting the traditions of man. 
His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without performing first the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom, as it's described in verse 38. And Jesus then started to talk about cups and dishes on the table. The Pharisees were not only scrupulous about hand-washing, but about ritual purity. They washed themselves in ritual baths, and they washed their cups and their plates in ritual baths. The majority of the Pharisees belonged to the school of Shammai. They taught that the outside of the cup could be clean even if the inside was dirty. That's the teaching of the school of Shammai. The minority view held by the followers of Hillel was that the inside of the cup had to be cleaned before the outside or it could never be wholly clean. So Jesus here agrees with Hillel and then he applies the rule to the people around the table. And by extension, this applies to all of us. Jesus says that unless the inside is clean, the whole can never be clean. And Jesus tells them that they are filthy. They are full of greed and wickedness. They've washed their hands scrupulously, and their cups and their plates, but they are filthy. Jesus, of course, has done none of these things. None of these rituals, and yet Jesus is perfectly, spotlessly clean. Jesus has a clean heart. The rest of us, we have dirty hearts. Now, the other people around the breakfast table with Jesus knew he was telling them they had dirty hearts. They understood that. And perhaps they were prepared to answer back, or maybe they were just thinking to themselves, how ridiculous that idea was. After all, they tithed diligently, down to the correct proportion of their herbs. The law of the Old Testament does not command anyone to tithe their garden herbs. The Pharisees would enjoy long debates on such topics as whether a herb was food or not food. And thus, what laws of the Old Testament a herb was subject to. In their meticulous observation of the Old Testament law, the Pharisees were also very strict about social hierarchy. In public places and in the synagogues, people were seated according to their rank. And their rank was determined by, among other things, their knowledge of the law. And the custom of that day dictated particular greetings for different people of different rank. Jesus here is being quite offensive by accusing such superior people of being unclean. You ignore justice and the love of God, Jesus says. They are focusing on the wrong things. They are spending too much time, too much effort, arguing about things that are not even commanded in Scripture. And they are ignoring the important things that Scripture does come out. And so I think all of us, we all need to take a moment to look at our own lives. 
and think in case we're doing the same thing. Jesus makes the point that what they are doing makes them no different from a hidden tomb. They thought a person was defiled by any contact with a grave or with a dead person. A corpse could spread ritual impurity faster than almost anything. And these Pharisees taught that you could become ritually impure even if your shadow touched a corpse or a grave. A hidden grave was therefore a serious problem. A person could become impure by accident. And to prevent this from happening, the tombs were whitewashed. And Jesus says that on the contrary, the Pharisees do not have whitewash. In verse 44, Jesus tells them straight, you are like hidden graves in a field. People walk over them without knowing the corruption they are stepping on. And then, when a prominent lawyer complains that he's been insulted, Jesus goes even further. The job of the teachers of the law was to guide people in the ways of obedience to the law. It is part of the job of a teacher to help people understand, to clear up confusion. Instead, says Jesus, these people are obscuring God's ways with all kinds of petty, burdensome rituals and customs that they've made up themselves. And Jesus says they crush people with unbearable religious demands, and they do nothing to help them. That's what it's like to have a meal with Jesus. It isn't about the food. And perhaps our meals, our meals should also be times of talking. Our meals should be times of sharing, seeking the deeper ways of God around the table. If Jesus does come and sit down with us, he's likely to say things that make us feel uncomfortable. If we listen, if we humbly listen and obey him, we will learn so much and perhaps, perhaps, we shall no longer be a corrupting influence in this world and we will be instead a blessing in this world. Filled with the Holy Spirit, purified inside, we are learning not to focus on the burdensome rituals made by man, but on what Jesus said was important, justice and the love of God. God isn't calling us to be experts in religious law. God is calling us to be experts in love and fellowship. We are called to be holy priests, who minister to all God's people. So why don't we try if this next week we can discern in our own lives areas where we have wrong priorities, where we have a wrong focus. Maybe you can invite Jesus to eat with you. Ask the Holy Spirit to be candid in his evaluation of your own purity. Ask him to give you some advice on how to live a kingdom life. Amen.